guys are here today. My name is uh, Brian, one of the pastors here at Cross Point Church. And uh, I was just thinking this past week about, you know, as humans, we are very much alike, but also at the same time as humans, we are very much different as well. Uh, I'm curious, how many of you are married today? Raise your hand if you're, if you're married today. Uh, several of you are. Those of you that are married will be able to understand this, that, you know, sometimes you, you are, you know, they say opposites attract. Opposite attract. How many feel like you married somebody completely opposite of you? <laughs> Maybe it's better said after you get married, like opposites attract before you get married, but then after you're married, opposites attack. Because <laughs> you're just so much different than each other along the way. And I, I'm just going to kind of do a survey today. This is for all of you, married, single. Uh, we recognize that we're, we're different just in our personalities and the way we do life, the way we operate, the, the way that we perceive things. And so uh, I'm going to just kind of give you some different scenarios. And you can self-identify. If this is you, just raise your hand, say, that's me. You can shout amen. You can clap. You can hit your neighbor and say, that's you. Yeah. Yeah. How do you want to do it? So, so I recognize that, that here there are some people that enjoy balancing or in their budget. They enjoy balancing the budget every week, every month, whatever it may be. And if you have like two cents missing, you'll spend like four hours, okay, looking for those two pins. That's you. Just got to raise your hand along the way. And you know who you are, okay? And then, that, that's you. And then other people, they would rather balance a spoon on their nose than balance their budget. I mean, that's you. <laughs> you know who you are. Some of you are rule followers. If you're a rule follower, would you just raise your hand? Notice that? See, they all did it. They all follow the instructions, follow the rules, raise your hand. Uh, others of you, you are more like rules or suggestions to be considered. <laughs> Jeez. Last night, Shannon and I, we were working on Braden's Legos. He got this new Lego car that he had. And so, you know, we were putting it together. He's been in bed for an hour. Shannon and I are like working on the <laughs> Legos and couldn't get the wheels to actually turn. And so, Shannon, she's following the rules and following the directions. You know, you have this like manual to put these Legos together for my seven year old son. And finally, she's, she's like, I can't figure this out. I said, Let me see it. And uh, she was like, Where's well, the I don't know. You know, just start breaking things apart, putting things together. Like, that's good. Yeah, but the wheels work, right? That's what matters a little bit. <laughs> Some of you are people that are always on time. Raise your hand for the people that are on time. You were the people honking the horn today. You were the ones that say, come on, let's go. It's got to get going. How many of you would say, I'm on time, give or take 15 minutes? That's, that's me. You are. I don't even say you're the kind of person you, you organize your shirts by color. Organizing your shirts by color. I mean, is that you're doing good just to get your shirts hung up? <laughs> How about this one? Clutter is annoying. You cannot stand clutter in a car, in a room, in your office. Oh, I mean, you're like, it's not clutter, it's character. It's character. <laughs> I'm the last one. How many of you, when the gas tank gets to a quarter of a tank, you're like, enough is enough, and we have to go get some gas. It's like on the quarter tank. These are the people that are never going to run out of gas. How many of you are gaslight on, riding on fumes, capitally empty? There we go. That's me too. Shannon and I, one time, when I was getting ready to work for this college, it, and uh, I was being interviewed by the president of the college, so he invited us to go to, to dinner on this interview. So it was the president, his wife, and, and Shane and I. So we're driving an hour and a half, and I had put gas in my car. And I, I looked down, and Shane was like, we're not going to make it. And, and we're like just a couple miles away. And you know how like, I tell you, it's like, Shane, it's just three miles. We're fine. We're going to be good. We're good to go. And, and so sure enough, as we came off the on-ramp, the car ran out of gas. I had to put it in neutral and literally roll into the gas station. That's, that's a little bit into my DNA, which freaks some people out. But uh, pray for Shannon. She needs to be <laughs> In the Midwest, we have these gas stations. They're all over the place, and uh, they're called Come and Go. Come and Go. Matter of fact, uh, Pastor Matt used to work at Come and Go. He's got some great stories. We, we tried to find a picture of Pastor Matt with his Come and Go like, shirt on and everything, but 
couldn't find one, but as I was thinking about this whole gas station experience that I had as I pulled in that come and go, these are two words that summarize the message of Jesus. Jesus says, come, and then he says, go. <laughs> to the hurting, to the lost, to those of you that may be here today that are confused, or broken, or grieving, or frustrated, and guilty, or depressed, Jesus says, come. He says, come, come to me. But to those of us that have been saved, to those of us that have been healed, to those of us that have been transformed by the powerful name of Jesus that we just sung about, what God tells us, those of us that our lives have been turned upside down for the better, he says to us, go. The verb changes. He says, go. Now to those that he says, come, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, come to me. All of you that are weary and carry a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. And as I think about the time that our country is in right now, I believe that our country is in a state of being weary and carrying a heavy burden and feeling a weight. Now, I'm here to tell you today, it's not about an elephant, it's not about a donkey. It's about the Lamb. Yes. It's about Jesus. Yes. And that when we are heavy and weary and finding tension and finding trouble and even finding relational damage because of our strong opinions and because of our strong beliefs and we find these relational challenges in our country as well as in our lives, may I remind you that Jesus has come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy with burdens, and I'll give you rest. Here's what he says. Here's, his, here's, here's, here's what he's telling us to do. He says, verse 29, take my yoke upon you. I said, well, what is a yoke? A, a yoke is a farmer's term. It's whenever you yoke two cattle together. And when you take two cattle together, they're stronger. They can be able to handle more of a burden. They can handle more of a load together than they can alone. And for some of you today, you're carrying the burden all by yourself. And God's saying, stop carrying all the weight. He said, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Let me walk through this journey with you today. I was reading about horses being yoked together, coming together. And, and I read that one horse alone can pull a load of 8,000 pounds. That's a big load. One horse can be able to carry. But yoked together with another one. Together, you would think that they would be able to carry a load of 16,000 pounds, but that's not true. They can actually carry a load of 24,000 pounds while they're yoked together. And Jesus says, are you carrying a heavy burden? Are you carrying more than you can handle on your own? He says, yoke up with me. Let me help share the load. If you're stressed right now, Jesus says, partner with me. Come, come to me. But after you're in the family of God, your life's been changed. He says, go. Luke chapter 7, verse 50. He says, your faith has saved you. Now, what's the next word? Go. Go, go in peace. Yes. James. James is a passage of scripture. James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love reading the book of James. It's a very practical book. If you're looking for a place to start reading, I would encourage you to read the book of James. James is written to believers. It's not written for those that aren't believers. It says in James chapter 1, James is servant of God to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, greeting my brothers. Then he goes on, it says, count it all joy when you fall into temptation, when you, when you get tested. And he goes on and he explains more in James, but here's the point. James is writing to brothers and sisters in Christ. He's writing to the believers. And here's what he says in the book of James. So you see, Faith by itself isn't enough. Now, what he's not saying is he's not saying you, you need to work for your salvation. Remember, he's already talking to believers. And we've already learned that you, you get to heaven not, by slip on what, not based upon what you D-O do, but what has D-O-N-E already been done for you through Jesus' death on the cross. We're saved by grace, not by works, is what Ephesians says. So he says faith by itself isn't enough. He's not saying that you need to work your way to God. But he is saying, those of us that have faith in God, 
unless it produces good deeds, your faith is dead and it's useless. So here's what he's saying as followers of God, that if you're not going in your faith, your faith is dead and it's useless. God is in the business of telling people to go. He told Noah, go and go build an ark. He told Abraham, go to another country. I'm going to give you a new home. He told Moses, go back to Egypt and go get the children of Israel. I want to tell you the story today. It's found in Luke chapter 14. And it's the story of this guy that was a, a very loving, generous man. This was a man that understood hospitality. He loved being around people. and He, he understood the value of community and friendships and relationships. He understood the importance of yoking up together to be able to share each other's burdens. And so he said, I'm going to throw this big party and I want to invite everybody over to my, my party. So this is going to be an incredible celebration. So he tells the people that work for him, he says, go out, get the invitations, invite everybody to be able to come. So all these people go out and they start posting notes and telling them, everybody come to this party and here's what it's going to be and it's going to be this amazing party. And then these people start giving excuses. And people say, well, I'm sorry, I can't go to the party. And they say, well, why can't you go to the party? And some of the people say, well, I just bought a field and I have to go see it. So I, I can't go. The other person says, I just acquired five pair of cattle. I got to try them out. I, I can't go. Another one says, I just got married. So I, I can't come. I, I, I've got a lot on my plate right now. This is not a good season for me. It's not a good time. I can't do it. And when this was all told to the man hosting the party, he got angry. He said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys. He said, bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame as my guests. And the guys that worked for him said, we already did that. And there's still a lot more room. So in Luke chapter 14 and verse 23, here's, here's what he says. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come. Why? So that the house will be full. I want the house full. I want people to enjoy this incredible experience that we have planned. Then he goes on and he issues this warning. This is a sad commentary. It says, for none of those that I first invited, all the people that were too busy, they won't get to, it says that they uh, will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. They're not going to enjoy even the smallest taste, they're going to miss out. See, here's what God says. God says, I want you to be part of my family. And I have this incredible experience. I have this incredible adventure that I want you to be a part of. I want you to be a part of my faith community. I want you to be part of my church. And it's going to be an amazing celebration. I want you to be part of my plan. I prepared for it. I've got it ready. And I want you to be a part of it. And then he goes out and he tells all of us, he says, hey, tell all the people to come, all the people poor, or blind, lame, whoever they are, have them, have them come, have them be a part. Then he tells all of us, go, go, go tell people, go tell people, go tell people. But people today have a lot of excuses, just like the people in that day of age and time. And some of them said, well, I just, I, I, I can't do it because I bought this, this farm and, and, you know, I just, I got a lot going on right now. Another guy says, you know what, I, I just bought this cattle, which is like his business and his assets and his new equipment. And, and they let their business keep them from accepting God's invitation and call. And other people say, well, I just got married. And they let this relationship keep them from God's invitation. And I would just say that one of the reasons why I believe people today are having so much challenge in their life is because they're too busy. Some of you are too busy right now. And when we wear busyness as this badge of honor, it's like, what are we asking? Wait, hey, uh, how's things going? And we say, I'm busy. And so it's as if we're like, oh, awesome, good. You're doing good. You must be doing good. You're busy. We wear it like it's a badge of honor. It's not a badge of honor to be busy. As a matter of fact, I think it's a badge of brokenness. Of us keep trying to acquire for whatever reasons, for our own self, our own significance, whatever it may be. Now, I'm not saying work is bad. We have to work. I'm not saying the things we pursue are all bad. I'm just saying we have to be careful of letting good things turn into God things. And if you're too busy for God, you're too busy. If you're too busy for God, you're too busy. 
We have to be careful when God says, hey, I want you to come. I want you to be part of this. In this series, I told you I was going to poke you and prod you and challenge you in your faith. And this message is the last message in this series called Faith on the Move. And in this series, we've learned to grow. I'm just curious, how many of you are involved in the growth group? Would you raise your hand really high? We had over 600 people involved in our growth group studies. I honor so many of you. You've gotten community with other people. You're praying with other people. You're learning stories from Hebrews chapter 11. And some of you have grown more in the last few months than you have in a long time. And that's what this series is about. It's about growing in our faith. I've told you before, you're either climbing spiritually or you're sliding. There's no standing still. And many of you, you're climbing and on your feet. So this was a series about growing. This was also a series about sowing. And I challenge us to this faith on the move commitment offering. And I ask you to sow into God's kingdom. I ask you to sow into God's purpose and his mission. I am so pleased to announce, we set a goal. We announced it last week. We had our celebration Sunday. For those of you that missed it, though, I just want you to hear what God did collectively through all of us. Not, not through, you know, one or two people. It was all of us pulling our arms together. We set a goal of raising $1.5 million. And I'm pleased to announce that we raised $1.95 million. $1 million. And our commitment Sunday that we had, and those of you that have already, already given towards that just the last couple of weeks, we have already had $340,000 of cash come in already. Guys, I honor you. You are a church that understands generosity and understands the importance of the church having a home so we can be able to create and experience so people can be able to come and understand their purpose and their mission and find help and find hope in Jesus' name. And then last week, I'm pleased to announce we signed the purchase and sale agreement. We have officially sold this church. Guys, we didn't even put the church on the market. God was our real estate agent. He said, I've given you a new place. I've given you a new home. And we praise God for what he's doing in the life of our church. But this isn't just a series about growing and sowing. This is a series about us going. So in just the few minutes I have left, I want to tell you what I believe God's doing in our faith to go. Remember, he says, come, and then he says, go. So I want to give you an acronym for faith, F-A-I-T-H. What does it mean to go? Here's our challenge I believe God has for us in our next three years. So we look at this next season. Some may call it the 2020 vision. What's the future for us? Number one is this. We're going to fill up our new worship center. And we're going to fill it up multiple times. Why? Because Jesus said, urge anyone you find to come so that my house will be full. Now, some people have said, Pastor Brian, I'm a little nervous about us going to this new building. They said, I'm nervous about it because big churches, I've heard this, people said big churches are not friendly. And we're so friendly here. We love each other. We care for each other. And I'm just afraid that we're not going to be friendly. And here's the good news. All the friendly people of our church, they're all coming with us. <laughs> the people aren't changing. The location changes. But remember, the church it isn't the building. The church is the people. It's you and it's me. So we're collectively going together. And we have to continue to reach people for Jesus. And, and, and here's why. Because some people have said, Pastor Brian, I think our church is big enough. We have enough people. What if we would have said that when we were running 250 people? Some of you wouldn't be here right now. What if we would have said one service is good enough? What if we would have got to 500 people and said, that's enough. That's good. See, I just believe this. There's a lot of people that need Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. And if you're not going to heaven, you're going the other place. And I don't want people to go to hell. As a church, we made a decision that we're not going to be a holy huddle. You know what a holy huddle is? Everybody gets together and put their arms around each other. They say, us four, no more, shut the door. <laughs> and when there's a huddle, 
All you see is we're rich. As a church, we say as long as there are people out there that don't know Jesus, we're commanded to go reach them. Jesus has never met a person he doesn't love. God's never met a person he didn't die for. God's never met a person he doesn't want in heaven. The Bible says God is actively seeking people who will worship him. So here's what I want to challenge you to do, church. Keep your radar on. I have this prayer I've been praying since the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, I've been waking up each morning, I've been praying this prayer. I won't give you the full prayer, but I'll give you one little phrase in my prayer. My, my, one phrase in my prayer is, God, my radar is on. I just, that's how I'm going to start my day. God, my radar is on. My, my heart is open. My mind is receptive. My eyes are alert. My radar is on. I want to challenge you to have your radar on. So well, what am I looking for? What's my radar looking for? You're looking for people going through trouble, tension, or transition. Because when people are going through trouble, tension, and transition, that's when they need hope. That's when they need Jesus. And I believe that God will use you in people's life when they're going through trouble, tension, and transition. And God knows that our country right now is going through some trouble, some tension, and some transition this time. And what do they need? They need Jesus. But what do people need? They need people that have Jesus inside of them. So when you hear somebody's going through trouble, tension, or transition, your radar is on, here's your next step. I want to challenge you just to simply say, and some of you never said this before, this is taking a step of faith. It's making your faith go on the move. Just simply tell people, say, can I pray for you? Just say, can I pray for you? That's a step of faith for some of you. Then to pray for you. For some of you, God may lead you into the next step. When people are going through trouble, tension, and transition, you may simply say, can I pray for you? And they say yes, and you might just pray for them right then and there. I realize that's really getting out of your comfort zone for some of you. But maybe God's leading you to go on the move, to take another step. So can, I, can I pray for you? Here's another question I love to ask people. When people are going through trouble, tension, and transition, I ask people, I say, have you found a good church yet, or are you still looking? Can I tell you that's a very non-threatening question to ask people? People don't get offended by that. Never had anybody get angry at me over that question. And you know, oftentimes people will tell me, I haven't found a good church yet. So you know, I'd love to invite you to one of our services. See, I'm, I'm keeping my radar on. I want you to keep your radar on for people that are going through trouble, tension, and transition. And I want to challenge you to pray and trust God to give you the privilege of bringing one person to Christ by 2020. One person to Christ. That you'll bring one person to come to faith. One person to get baptized. One person maybe to join your growth group. One person to get involved in the ministry with you. One person. Here's my question. Is anybody going to heaven because of you? Is anybody going to heaven because of you? I have to tell you a cool story. Rick and Lisa over here. Rick and Lisa, you guys stand real quick. I don't need to embarrass you. I just want to celebrate. <laughs> Lisa and Rick have asked us to pray for Lisa's father, who uh, was far away from God and was sick. They weren't sure how long he, he had to live. And so Lisa would come to our prayer meetings on Tuesday mornings and we would pray, and every week she'd write on the connection card, praying for her father, praying for her father. And this church, we've been around for two years now. We've been praying almost every single week. And I'm pleased to announce that this past week, she got an opportunity to lead her father to the Lord. Can we say that? Rejoice. My question is this. Is anybody in your family going to be in heaven because of you? Any of your friends going to be in heaven because of you? Any of your co-workers going to be in heaven because of you? Here's the second thing we're going to do. We're going to assist needy people locally. Faith, F-A-I-T-H. We're fill up a worship. We're going to assist needy people locally. Matthew 25, 40 says, And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. We have a monthly outreach that goes out and serves people. 
that assist people locally. Sometimes they go to the senior center. Once they'll go over there and just encourage the elderly, the people that have nobody that there that is able to help them or, or talk to them or visits them. And they'll just go and bring Jesus in Jesus' name. But sometimes they go and they go to some of the people that live right in our area, right in our neighborhood, and they have absolutely nothing. To continue to do those things, to assist needy people locally, we're going to interconnect our church family through digital technology. Romans 15, 6 says that all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't downloaded our Crosspoint app yet, I want to encourage you to download the app today. You can go into the App Store. Uh, it's available on Apple or Android, and it's Crosspoint OC. And a couple of cool features that are on our app is if you are with somebody and they need prayer, just tell them, say, hey, we can actually pray. We have 100 people that will pray for you by name right now. You can be able to give that to anybody on the app. Uh, you can be able to go in there, and uh, it says prayer right there. You can be able to actually put in a prayer request right then, and 100 people will pray specifically by name for whatever your need is or anybody you know going through trouble, tension, or transition. There's a Bible on here with commentaries you can be able to find on our app, uh, as well as our media. So if you want to be able to download a message and listen to a message, uh, maybe while you're in your car, all of our videos, all of our messages are on here as well. Uh, you can be able to find so many different resources. You can be able to give online. All those things are all set up through our app. So I want to challenge you to download the app. We're going to interconnect our church family through digital technology. And when we get into our new building, we're already preparing the way for video editing, video engineers, cameras, all kinds of things that I believe God is wanting to use some of you guys in this ministry. Then we're going to train leaders. Ephesians 4 says that our responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. God's laid it upon my heart this next year to really connect closer and tighter with ministry leaders as well as those that want to be involved in ministry growth opportunities as well. So every other month, we're going to have a training session we're calling SALT. It's a sold-out advanced leadership team. And we're going to come alongside our Awanas, our marriage ministry, Silver Recovery, all of our key leaders from our host groups and other places. And those of you that would like to step up in other roles that you believe God's called you, we're going to train you even more effectively. God's called us to do some of these things. And so that's what we're going to do in the next three years. And then we're going to help take the good news to Mexico, Guatemala, the Philippines, and Africa. We're calling this our international crawl, walk, run, sprint. Next year, Pastor Jeff has been working dil diligently to be able to open up a new feeding center in Mexico. And we're going to take some more mission trips. Last year, we took almost 100 people on mission trips. We want to take more in 2017. And so we're going to make it more affordable and closer and shorter trips by doing some things in Mexico. We're working through the security, all those things. We're going to do a trip. We're calling it. Beans and rice in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Inexpensive. It's going to be amazing. We want you guys to be a part of that as well. Last thing I'll tell you is this. When God says go, never say no. When God says go, never say no. One day you're going to stand before God and God's going to say, Did you receive my son Jesus? Some of you are going to say, Yes, I did. Then he's going to ask you a second question when you get to heaven. He's going to say, did you go after you received my son Jesus? Did you do anything with it? Some of you are going to say, no. He's going to say, why? I told you to. I didn't just want you to get saved. I left you on earth to tell people about me. What kind of a legacy are you going to leave? Listen, the people, those of you that have given to the faith of the move, you're leaving an incredible legacy that's going to be far beyond you and I. The people that were part of this commitment, that made a three-year commitment, those of you, I believe you're going to get to heaven one day, and people are going to say, hey, you were the one that were part of that faith on the move journey, weren't you? You were there at Cross Point. I got to meet you. I believe you're going to have people from all over the world that are going to come, and they're going to meet you. They're going to say, you were part of that faith on the move. That's when you gave your part. People are going to come to you and they're going to say, because of what you did, because of what Crosspoint did, I came to know Jesus. I lived in Guatemala. I lived in the Philippines. I lived in Anaheim. 
I lived in your Belinda, Placentia, Brea. And I'm in heaven because of you. And I believe people are going to say thank you. Do you know anything in your life that's going to be bigger and more important than that? If you do, stand up right now and tell us. If you know a more important thing to do with your life than bringing people to find and follow Jesus, I'd like to know. Because I've dedicated my entire life. And I've told God, I'm not going to waste my life. I don't want you to waste your life either. I can't imagine me getting to heaven and somebody coming up to me and saying, Hey, were you part of Cross Point like 2016, 17, 2018? I'd be like, yeah, 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 I was there. Were you there when they did Faith in the Move? Yeah, yeah, I was there. You saw it all happen? Yeah, yeah. What was it like to participate? I can't imagine telling people, well, I didn't really participate. Are you kidding me? You were there and you didn't participate? What were you thinking? See, what's your legacy going to be? Psalm 2 and verse 8 says this. If you ask me, I'll give you the nations, all the people, and all the earth will be yours. That's my prayer. Not every church has that prayer, but that's our, that's our church prayer.